Welcome to part three of our gas law series. Part three is really only applicable for the honors chemistry course, but if you're CP, you can feel free to watch this. Um, it will develop and enhance your understanding of gases as well. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at some additional gas laws in addition to the big three that we've already talked about. Now, we've already looked at three gas laws. We've said that if temperature is constant, we can track the relationship between pressure and volume using Boyle's law. If pressure's not changing and only volume and temperature are changing, we can use Charles's law here to predict the um, changes. And if volume is not allowed to change, maybe like we're in a sealed glass container or something, um, we can see how temperature and pressure affect each other using Gay-Lussac's law. But what if all three of these variables were allowed to change. Well, no fear. There is the combined gas law, which basically combines all those previous laws that we looked at. And it is known as, as I said, the combined gas law, where we have P1 times V1 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over T2. Now, of course, in, a, in order to be able to use this formula, there's a lot of variables that you need to know. So you're not going to use this one too often, but occasionally you will need to break it out. Now, we want to take a look next at the relationship between pressure and volume and the number of particles. So I've got some questions for you here to look at. So here you can see I have three balloons. All three of these balloons are at the same volume. Hopefully they look like they're the same size because I tried to make them that way. They're also at the same temperature and the same pressure. So my question is, how do you think the number of particles in each balloon compare? If they're the same size, same temperature and pressure, my helium balloon, think about helium particles compared to CH4, that's methane, and here's some nitrogen. What do you think is true about the number of particles in each balloon? Or another question, what do you think the mass of each balloon is? How do you think the mass compares to each other? And finally, if you were able to see the particles buzzing around in there, um, how do you think the speed of the particles compare? Okay, I use the word molecules, but really um, these two would be molecules, the helium, it would just be atoms. So I'll just use particles to be a little more correct here. Now, in order to help you answer these questions, we need to understand a little bit more about the relationship between the number of particles and the volume, temperature, and pressure of a gas. So let's take a look at that relationship. Now, the relationship with the number of particles was established by a guy by the name of Avogadro. Um, if you haven't already learned this, later on, you'll recognize a very important number that he had, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, but going back to gases, basically what Avogadro's law states that if I've got two samples of a gas, if they have the same volume under the same conditions, same temperature and pressure, then they must have the same number of particles. So in my orange balloon, okay, we've got our three balloons here. All three, we're saying they are at the same temperature and at the same pressure. So if my orange balloon has a volume of two liters, and let's say somehow we were able to figure out that there's 1.2 times 10 to the 24th particles in that orange balloon. Well, my pink balloon, since it's under the same conditions, and since it has the same volume, therefore it must have the same number of particles. It must have 1.2 times 10 to the 24th. Now here, we have our yellow balloon. Now if we knew for a fact that our yellow balloon had 1.2 times 10 to the 24th particles, and it was also at the same temperature or pressure, then we could predict what the volume would be. What do you think it is? Well, if you said two liters, you would be correct. So as long as we've got the same number of particles, and they're at the same temperature and pressure, they're going to have to have the same volume and vice versa. Now, another interesting thing about this is that it does not depend on what type of gas that you have. If I have helium, and if my helium has 1.2 times 20 to the fourth um, atoms of helium in that balloon, and it has a certain volume, again, if that volume of helium is two liters, and if I had some methane, if my methane had the same number of particles, it would also have a volume of two liters. So again, with our issue here is no matter what type of gas you have, if we had the same number of particles, our volume would have to be the same, would have to be two liters. And uh, then if we look at the nitrogen, again, if I knew that that's how many particles of nitrogen were in there, it would have to have the same volume. It does not depend, does not matter at all on what type of gas you have present. So uh, another relationship to look at here is if I've got some volume, what would my pressure be. Let's move this so it's in the middle of the screen. Here you go. So this is a nice little simulation. And let's go ahead and start with um, some, let's see, I guess this says it's neon, some neon particles. So right now I've got one mole of neon particles in there. Now if you're not familiar with a mole, it's just a way of counting things. It's like one dozen. Uh, so uh, I've got one mole of neon particles in there. And we can see that with my one mole of gas particles, we can see that my volume is 9.02. Now, what would happen if I increased the number of particles in here? Now this device that it's in is a piston type device. That means that this um, level here is free to move up and down. It's gonna maintain a constant pressure. So if the pressure in here were to get greater, uh, it would actually just move to adjust so that my pressure actually still remained at the 2.51. So let's put, in fact, let's double the amount of particles in there. Starting with one mole, let's go ahead and put more particles in. 
until we have two moles. Well, my volume started out at just above nine, and you can see when we doubled the number of particles, my volume got bigger, my volume doubled. Makes sense. Um, twice as many particles needs twice the volume. Now, here's another interesting thing. It does not depend on what type of gas you have. I've got two moles of particles in here right now. They all happen to be neon right now. Well, if I moved it back down to one, well, my volume went back down to nine liters. And um, if I add one mole of helium particles in there, so I have a total of two moles of particles now, one of them neon, one of them helium. Well, notice my volume, again, is 18.015. So it does not matter whether I have um, two moles of just neon, two moles of neon, 18.015. Okay, or if I have one of each, it's still going to be 18.015. So as we can see here, uh, the volume simply depends on how many particles you have. So if I've got 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the 24th particles, and if my volume of that would happen to be one liter at that particular pressure and temperature, if I were to double the number of particles, my volume... As you can saw, as you saw in that animation there, my volume will double to be two liters. So um, there's our statement there. The number of particles is directly proportional to the volume, as long as my pressure is constant. We allow the volume to adjust to keep the pressure constant, and then of course we're assuming temperature is not changing either. Now another question we could look at is how does the number of particles affect the pressure that's of a gas? Now in this situation, we're going to keep the volume constant. In our last simulation, we kept pressure constant and we allowed the volume to change like a balloon or like a syringe. In this situation, we're going to have a fixed volume. So you can think about a sealed glass container or something like that. So we're going to see, well, what happens when I increase the number of particles? So let's take a look. We'll bring this little simulation up. So uh, right now you can see here's our pressure reading. Right now I have no particles in there. And in order to have pressure, you have to have collisions. If I've got no particles, no collisions. So let's put 100 particles in our little simulation here. Now you can see we have two different types of particles. I have heavy ones and light ones. Um, they would represent different elements. And uh, so you can see with my 100 particles, you can see my pressure's averaging mm, close to about 0.5. It's fluctuating maybe a little bit over 0.5. Um, so that's what my pressure is there. Let's go ahead and double the number of particles in there. I'll put 200 particles in total. And as you guessed, if I have twice as many particles in there, now since my volume is still the same, I'm going to have twice as many collisions. And therefore you can see that my pressure has doubled. It went from 0.5 to about 1.0. Um, now that was for the heavy particles, whatever that was. So let's go ahead and take all of those heavy particles out and let's put 100 of the light particles in. Well, remember 100 of the heavy particles, we had a pressure of 0.5. Well, it looks like we're getting about the same thing here. 100 of the light particles, we're still getting the same pressure. Remember, pressure is a function of the collisions. Since I have the same number of particles, I'm going to be having the same number of collisions, and therefore, um, it's still 0.50. And if I doubled my number of particles here, well, volume is the same, so we'll be doubling the number of collisions, and so no surprise, I've got about one atmosphere pressure. We doubled the pressure. Now, again, what if I put 100 of each? Okay, so again, my light particles, I've got 200 of them. Pressure is about one atmosphere. So what if I put 100 of the light particles in? And we'll put 100 of the heavy particles in. Now, they're moving a little slower since they're heavier, so we'll give that a time to equalize. But again, we're getting a pressure of about 1.0. Okay, we let that stabilize. It'll come back down a little bit, a little closer to 1.0. So again, we see that it really is independent of what type of gas we have. If we've got the same number of particles, we're going to have the same pressure. Okay, so again, if I look at my boxes, if I've got 1 times 10 to the 24th particles, and if my pressure of that one, uh, at that whatever volume that is, um, if that was 2 atmospheres, if I went ahead and uh, had another box, if I were able to double the number of particles in that box, again, we will double the pressure. So my pressure goes up to four atmospheres. So there's our relationship there. Um, again, in this situation, we are holding volume constant. So with, with volume not changing, if I double the particles, doubles the pressure. Makes sense. Okay, so as we can see here to summarize, both pressure and volume are proportional to the number of particles. We double one um, number of particles, it'll double those. So let's go back and take a look at our initial questions that I had asked you. Uh, I asked you these three questions, so what I'd like you to do is to pause the video now and go ahead and write down your answer to each of these three questions, and we'll see if you're correct. Pause it now. All right, let's take a look at what you said. Now, if they all have the same volume, for question number one, then hopefully it was pretty easy for you to say, well, they must have the same number of particles. So that's the correct answer for the first one. For the second one, how does the mass in each balloon compare? Well, if I've got the same number of particles... They're actually not going to have the same mass because helium atoms are lighter than methane atoms. And so since each helium atom has a different mass than each methane molecule, 
my helium balloon is actually going to have less mass than my methane balloon does. So why my helium balloon floats. And the nitrogen as well is going to have a different mass. So all three of these guys are going to have different masses. Uh, in fact, actually, they will go in this order. The helium's the smallest, um, the methane would be the next heaviest, and the nitrogen would have the most mass. And finally, talking about the speed. Now, this one's a little trickier. Um, remember, if they're at the same temperature, they have to have the same kinetic energy. But remember your formula for kinetic energy. It's one-half mv squared, where m is the mass and v is the velocity. If these guys all have the same kinetic energy, but my nitrogen is heavier, well, that means my nitrogen must be moving slower in order to have the same kinetic energy as my helium. Since the helium's a lot lighter, these particles have to be moving faster to have the same kinetic energy. And then the methane would be somewhere in the middle. It's just like our example we've talked about in class with the VW bug um, versus a 18-wheeler tractor trailer. Okay, the VW bug would have to be moving way faster to have the same amount of kinetic energy as the tractor trailer. And one final law that actually has to do with number of particles is Dalton's law of partial pressure. Now, what this law refers to is if you have a mixture of gases. Maybe you've got a tank that has both hydrogen and helium in it. Well, each individual gas would be exerting its own pressure, and so we would call that the partial pressure. Okay, so it's the pressure of just each individual gas if you've got a mixture of several different types of gases. And the way we think about this is really just think about each gas as if it were independent by itself. If I want to know um, what my pressure of hydrogen is at a certain volume, it doesn't matter if there's other gases in there. All I would need to know is, well, how many particles of hydrogen do I have in there? And it's going to have that pressure, regardless of what other gases are in there. Now, my total pressure is going to be more, but the hydrogen is going to contribute the same amount, regardless of what else is in there. So if I have uh, a tank, if I have uh, some hydrogen, such as we have here, at this particular volume, this is at 5 liters. So hydrogen in a 5 liter container at this temperature is going to contribute 2.9 atmospheres of pressure. So if I put that hydrogen in another container together with another gas, it doesn't matter about the other gas, the hydrogen is still contributing 2.9 atmospheres of pressure. Now, if I combine the hydrogen with the helium, okay, so let's say that we have enough helium, such as we have in this container, it's the same volume, so it's also 5 liters. So helium at this temperature and pressure in a 5 liter container is going to exert a pressure of 7.2 atmospheres. Well, if we were to combine these two into a container, Again, we're keeping a constant 5 liters. Well, the total pressure in here is just going to be the sum of the two because the helium, since it's still under the same conditions, it's still in a 5 liter container, I have that same amount of helium, it's going to contribute 2.9 atmospheres to the total. And um, I'm sorry, the hydrogen's 2.9. And that same amount of helium, since it's still in the same size, it's still 5 liters, the helium's going to contribute 7.2 atmospheres. Then the total pressure in the container is just simply the sum of the two. So my total pressure would just be 10.1. So Dalton's law of partial pressure it simply says that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressure for each individual one. So we have our pressure of gas one plus pressure from our second gas. Uh, and depending on how many gases you have, you can keep adding additional uh, terms to our equation there. So let's take a look at a question here. If uh, I have a scuba diver and in that tank we've got a mixture of helium and oxygen and the total pressure in the tank is eight atmospheres and I know that the oxygen is contributing 1,280 millimeters of mercury of pressure towards that, I want to know what the partial pressure of the helium is. Well, go ahead and pause the video now, take a minute, try to work that out on your own, and then um, start replaying the video, and I'll show you the solution to that. So pause the video now. Okay, let's look at the solution to this problem. So uh, first thing is to make our data table. So we know the total pressure in the tank was 8 atmospheres. We know the pressure from the oxygen was 1280 millimeters of mercury. We want to know, well, what is the pressure of the helium? Well, that's a Dalton's Law partial pressure question, uh, since I have a mixture of gases. So the total pressure is going to be the sum of the pressure from the oxygen plus the pressure from the helium. Now, I'm just rearranging it to get the helium by itself, because that's what we're solving for in this question. There's my rearranged formula. Now, we have a little problem because our units of pressure are mismatched. One of them's in atmospheres, one of them is in millimeters of mercury. It does not matter which one we change them to, we just need to get them both the same. So, uh, I decided to change everything into millimeters of mercury. So, I took my eight atmospheres, which was my total pressure. Um, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So, just doing that conversion tells me the total pressure, it's pretty high in that tank, is 6,080 millimeters of mercury. So I'm going to replace my 8 atmospheres with the 6,080. So I'm just popping that into my equation and um, subtract it from the pressure of the oxygen. So that tell, tells me that the helium in that container um, has a pressure of 4,800 millimeters of mercury. Now I'm asking why is that not our final answer? And let me just give you a hint. Sig figs.
Okay, we're subtracting. And remember, with sig figs, when you're adding or subtracting, you look at decimal place. In this case, um, both of my values are rounded. My last sig fig is in the tens place, so my answer has to go to the tens place. Well, written this way, I don't have a sig fig in the tens place, so what do I have to do? You guessed it. We need to put a line over that zero. Okay, my line's a little low, but imagine it's on top of the zero. So that's a fairly straightforward Dalton's Law partial pressure problem. Um, we put the two together. My pressure is just the total of the individual pressure of the two gases. Now, here's another one I'd like you to try. This one's a little bit more interesting. Uh, in this case, we've got a 3-liter tank of nitrogen, and inside of that tank, my nitrogen has a pressure of 1.34 atmospheres. And I have another tank that has oxygen in it under a pressure of 1.75 atmospheres. So my question is, if I put all of the oxygen from this tank and combined it with the nitrogen that's in this tank, okay, and we put them both, uh, I'm going to keep the nitrogen in this tank, we're going to add the oxygen to that one, so they're both in, this, in the same nitrogen tank now. My question is, what would the total pressure in the tank be? So go ahead and work this out, pause the video, and when you think you have an answer, play it, and I'll give you some hints. All right, let's see what you got. Now, I'll give you a little hint first. If you have an answer of 3.09 atmospheres, I'm afraid it's not quite that easy. Um, this one's a little more complicated because the oxygen is not in the same volume that it originally was. So right now, my oxygen exerts a pressure of 1.75 atmospheres. Well, the problem is when I take it out of the 1.3 liter tank and put it into the 3.0 liter tank, it now has a bigger volume to occupy, so it is not going to exert a pressure of 1.75. Its pressure is now going to be less than 1.75. So you're going to have to do a little work first to figure out what the pressure of the oxygen would be by itself in the bigger tank, and then you can use Dalton's Law to finally finish off the answer. So go ahead and come up with it. We'll talk about the answer in class tomorrow. Good luck.